Brad, welcome back to the show. The new book, I'm just trying to put it in the camera here, is Master of Change. And this is your book and, and take on acceptance commitment therapy, which AJ and I are huge fans of. This is the second time you've been on the show. The last time you were here, we were speaking about grounding. It was a very popular episode. Uh, and uh, certainly to get grounded is incredibly important. So um, to kick things off today, uh, what brought your interest to ACT and putting this book together and how does it relate to the work you've done with Grounded? What brought my interest into this topic is um, just living life. I think that I wrote this book for myself as much as anyone. In the past five years, I've been through so many changes. Um, I became a father for the first time and then for the second time. I had major orthopedic surgery on my leg that took me out of a sport that had been a pretty significant part of my identity for essentially my life. I moved across the country. I decided that I finally wanted to go on my own as a full-time writer and kind of ditched all of my corporate contracts. Um, I became really painfully estranged from specific family members. Um, I as you know from the last episode, I suffered a really dark depression related to OCD, and then I recovered from that. So like, who was I before? Who was I during? Who was I then? I mean, just all of these changes. And um, discussing this with friends, colleagues, family members, I realized that it's not just me. I think it's just being a, a human and kind of um, entering into middle adulthood that the pace of change really picks up. And then, of course, societally, we were all undergoing an enormous change together, uh, which was a once-in-a-generation pandemic. And I distinctly remember the day that I had the idea to write a book on this topic. So I was wrestling with all these changes in my own life. And I saw back-to-back -back headlines, one in the New York Times and one in the Wall Street Journal, so left and right, equally guilty. And they both talked about how pretty soon we're going to get back to normal. And I just remember that striking me the wrong way. Like, back to normal? <laughs> right, exactly. It, like, what are you talking about, back to normal? Um, and it's at that point when I said, all right, I've been wrestling with this idea personally. Clearly, the way it's being spoken about in society is, I think, backwards. Um, so let's see, let, let's go on a little intellectual exploration and, and see if there's not a there there for a book. Your, your first question about like how this relates to groundedness is I think like, the Practice of Groundedness is really a book about laying the foundation for stability. And then this book says, great, you did that, but change is still always going to happen and you better learn how to dance with it. You know, our body craves homeostasis. Every chemical reaction in your body is craving an equilibrium. What struck me in your explanation of the various changes you were going through is that some of those changes were by choice. And some of those changes you had zero agency in. So what does the science say around change that's forced on us versus change that we actually have some agency in? The science says that once that change is made, the body really doesn't differentiate too much. And this is true for positive and negative changes too. So um, something as joyful as getting married can lead to just as much like allostatic load or change stress as getting divorced. Um, so to the body, change is just change. Now, that's not to say that all changes are created equal. Getting into a tragic accident, um, suffering capital T trauma, that's a lot worse and a lot harder to reconcile with than a more minor change like you know breaking a bone or getting the flu. Um, but I think that's a good point because people assume that like, oh, well, you know, this was a voluntary change and it was positive, so therefore it'll be easy, but that still disrupts stability. Um, the research shows that the average adult experiences over 35 major life changes. Um, now, all those aren't negative. Many of those are positive, but it's a lot of change. And with that change, there's a few ways that the book is broken down. I want to start first with mindset because some of these situations, change is completely unexpected. But if you're working on your mindset and anticipating that there's going to be 35 major changes in my life, I'm going to be able to handle <laughs> and embrace this change in a much better way. So. What do we look at from a mindset perspective now knowing that data that there's likely to be on average 35 of these major changes, especially for those younger listeners who are like, well, I haven't had that many changes yet. There's still 30 on the horizon. So I think the two biggest prongs here are uh, acceptance. So we have to accept that change is inherent to life and that we're going to face it and that it might be hard at times. 
And then also to set appropriate expectations. So to expect change and to update our expectations when things go differently than we thought they would. The first tool that I'll share comes from one of my favorite intellectual thinkers of all time, Eric Fromm, who was a humanist philosopher and psychoanalyst in the 1900s. And in 1976, he wrote this book called To Have or To Be. And he talked about having is identifying with things that you own. And those can be objects, those can be relationships, those can even be attributes, like I own a great jump shot or I own a good bench press. Whereas being is identifying based on some more deeper essential core attributes of what make you who you are. So things like creativity, love, compassion, kindness. And Fromm argues that having makes you really fragile because all of these things at some point are going to change. And when they change, you won't know who you are. Whereas if we can orient around our being, around these essential values that make us who they are, those can't be taken away. Even throughout change, we can still lean on them. So I think part and parcel of accepting change is to try to get out of this having orientation and to adopt a more being orientation toward ourselves. So when you define yourself, it's less, you know, I am a writer, I am a dad, I am an athlete, and it's more I'm a caring person. I value creativity. I value intellect. And then the second important thing around updating expectations is this equation that um, has kind of become cliche, but it's based on years of science, which is your mood at any given time is a function of your reality minus your expectations. So if your expectations are better than your reality, your mood is going to be negative. And how this relates to change is that oftentimes we're going along life and we're expecting X to happen, and then Y happens. And the longer it takes us to update our view of reality and to update our expectations, the more we suffer and the less happy we are. So really important to both accept change, expect it's going to happen, and then when it does, update our thinking. And the story that makes this, I think, from concept to very real is I want to take everyone back to the early part of the COVID pandemic. And when COVID first came on, it was absolutely terrible. Death, despair, suffering, um, anxiety. And then we slowly but surely started to have some tools at our disposal. So we figured out certain therapeutic models that could help treat the disease. Vaccines came online. Protocols in the ICU made survival more likely. And then we reached a period in the summer of 2021 where COVID essentially went to zero in most places. And I distinctly remember this. My three-and-a-half-year-old then went into his friend's house, and it was the first time in his living memory he could go inside someone's house. He's like, we can, this is the coolest thing ever. And that was like the greatest summer because we were expecting it to be terrible, and then COVID like very quickly declined. But then the Delta variant came, and that was a fucking gut punch. And I distinctly remember myself and so many other people almost being more frustrated and more upset by the Delta variant than we were at the start of the pandemic, even though objectively things were much better off. Like we had tools, we had more knowledge. But what happened was our expectations were all this is over and then it was back. And the longer it took people to adapt, and the same is true for companies and companies and organizations to adapt, the more of it they unnecessarily suffered. So you made a point earlier that I, I want to touch on and, and do a little bit of a mental exercise around because that have versus be, even in your example, it, it was a subtle shift. So you, you mentioned like have a child, be a father, uh, I have a great jump shot. You start speaking about attributes or things that you really value. And then being, you can dig a level deeper into your haves to find the being. So if right now you're resting on your haves, I have this great house, I have these accomplishments. Well, what about you allowed you to buy that house, to reach that level of success? Was it you being an intellectual? Was it you being caring or a giver or compassionate? So I think right now for our audience members, if you find yourself over-indexing on have, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's looking past it, going a level deeper to your being that can actually help you overcome the change in potentially losing that job, losing that house, or having to reroute your entire life, move cross country, find new friends, find new people to care for. If at a base level you're a caring person, losing your friends, losing your family member, having tragedy happen to you, you're going to be able to weather a lot more easily than someone who's so tied to having 
those attributes or having those physical items. I just want to add to that as well. And I, I think that's a, an important distinction that everyone should, should look into it in, in our world of social media. It's all about, it's never about why I have these things. It's you all need to know that I have these things so that you all know that I'm awesome. And as AJ mentioned, well, all of the, that can all change in an, in an instant. And there is a reason of who you are that afforded you th to be able to get those things in your life. And in there lies skills and attributes that I think people would be very interested in learning about, which is your, your real value to who you are rather than the car or the house or the, 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 the vacations that you've been on. Yeah. And I think that, um, oftentimes the more that you're attached to the thing, so the car or the house, the more the real value is like being seen and loved because we look for love in all the wrong places. And like, it's never about the car or the house. It's about like wanting to be known and wanting to be loved. And I think owning that, uh, is really important because then you can start to say like, yeah, like that I'm really after deep connection. And anyone that spent too much time on Instagram knows this, that eventually like the superficial candy starts to feel pretty empty. Um, but it's a trap that I fall into. I'm sure you guys fall into, like everyone falls into it today. Um, but I think as we get a little bit older and wiser, we fall into it less often and for less, um, less, less intensely. You bring up a concept in the book, rugged flexibility. I haven't heard it in, in this context before I've heard obviously the words, but what do you mean by rugged flexibility and what can we do as an audience member to start to build rugged flexibility into our life? So this is one of the core concepts in the book. I'm really glad that you've asked about this. Most people hear the words ruggedness and flexibility and they think that they're complete opposites. So to be rugged is to be strong, durable, robust, maybe even rigid. And to be flexible is to bend easily without breaking. And most people, when confronted with change, go to one of these polar extremes. They either resist change, they deny it, they refuse to accept it, they dig in and they say, I'm going to be rugged and strong. This can't affect me. Then the other crowd is maybe the Zen Buddhist monastery crowd says, I'm just going to let go. And I'm just going to completely go with the flow and wherever life takes me, it's meant to be. And I think that there's a wide chasm in between those two approaches. And each of those approaches is most powerful when combined. So to recognize that, yes, we can't control everything. And yes, we do need to let go of control. And it is really valuable to go with the flow. But we also have agency in most, almost every situation in our life. So we shouldn't over-index and say, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, like personal responsibility, you know, you can do it. Because oftentimes the situation sucks. But we also shouldn't say you have to be so flexible that we're hopeless. So rugged flexibility is really about marrying like strength and agency and responsibility along with flexibility and letting go and accepting that sometimes you can't control everything. And, and navigating, na navigating change requires rugged flexibility. Like it's not, people are like, do I need to be rugged or flexible? It's like, yes, <laughs> you need to be both. <laughs> both, exactly. And Johnny mentioned earlier acceptance commitment therapy or ACT, which we've talked a lot about on the show, this Western philosophical view around therapy. But you also marry a lot of Eastern philosophies in your research for this book. And that duality comes up a lot in Eastern philosophy, this idea that it's not black and white. There's not only one way to approach the problem, the change, the frustration. But actually, oftentimes, you have to hold two completely opposite viewpoints in your hands and find the balance between the two to move forward. I want to add to that as well, which is, for our members in the X Factor, one of the, the, the commonalities between all of them is they've gotten to a point in their life where they're so successful in so many different areas, but lacking in a, in a certain area where they have goals to be set. And for whatever reason, those goals elude them. Yet they have seen flashes in their life of greatness in this realm of relationship building, social confidence, where they've seen what they're capable of, and they're leaning on that fact of, I have seen it. I know that it is in me, and I'm not going to go to these polar sides, either I have it or I don't. I'm going to be happily know that I've seen it. I know it's within me, and I'm, and I'm able to, to boost this and develop this. It, it is that belief, and being able to see uh, 
that those facts which allows them to be successful within the X Factor Accelerator. Yeah, it's non-dual thinking, like to a T, right? Not this or that, but this and that. Um, to AJ's point, like modern philosophy or modern psychological scientist would call this acceptance and commitment or maybe even cognitive behavioral therapy tenets. But we see this in every wisdom tradition. So in Buddhism, there's the two arrows. You can't control the first arrow, which is the random change, but you can control the second, which is how you react. In Stoicism, it's the Epictetus dichotomy of control, right? Like there are things that I can't control and there are things that I can focus on the latter. In Christianity, it's the serenity prayer. Uh, grant me the, the courage to accept the things I can't control and the power to change the things I can. Bruce Springsteen says, you know, being a mature adult, as quoted in the book, is meeting the world on its own terms without losing hope that you can't make it a little bit better. So yeah, it's science, it's wisdom, like of course it's both these things. And yet people tend to fall into these complete polarities. And I'm someone that like is an over-controller. So for a while I gravitated towards uh, Buddhism and Taoism and these philosophies of letting go and they helped me a lot. But I also like want to embrace some of that agency because the ability to problem solve and to fix things isn't all bad. It's like it, it works as long as it's also married with an acceptance that that only takes you so far. Now, going along with mindset, there is an identity piece to this. And oftentimes change is really difficult because it requires us to lose an identity that we feel really comfortable in or to realize that maybe we aren't this identity that we've been holding on to. And some of the changes you started as an example on the show over, there was an identity shift for you. Losing a big part of your physical identity around the sport that you love through an injury well, that can be soul crushing. We see that with a lot of professional athletes who their entire life, they've worked on this one craft, this one physical attribute that's allowed them to have this amazing career. But professional athletes' careers are pretty short. And an injury can wash all of that away. And your identity, if it's built solely on that, well, it's not going to allow you to embrace change. So how can we build an identity that embraces change? Or how do we have to hold or view identity to be able to handle the change that is coming? This is the favorite um, part of the book for me. So this is my favorite part of the book in proper English. Um, <laughs> I just loved what I learned in researching this because it's a mental model that makes so much sense and is so useful. So there are two important components to an identity that is resilient to change. The first is what researchers call self-complexity and what I call diversifying your sense of self. So I like to think of identity as a house with multiple rooms. You can have the athlete room, the parent room, the friend room, the creative room, the musician room, the chef room, the neighbor room, however many rooms you want. And it's okay to spend a few years even focused predominantly in one room, but you got to have those other rooms available. Because when things change in the basement, you want to be able to go up to the kitchen. So when I have an article or God forbid a book that flops, if that's my only room as a writer, I'm screwed. But if I got the dad room or the athlete room, I can lean into parenting. I can lean into my progress in powerlifting. When I get injured at the gym, if I've got the writer room, I can lean in there. So diversifying your sense of self by having multiple components to your identity, you don't need to be quote unquote balanced. You don't have to do them all equally all the time, but you should never just have one component of your identity. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that over time, as you change, as things change, it's kind of like our self is a river. That's the metaphor I like to use. So like we're flowing, we're always changing. But without a bank on each side, a river is just random water. And it's back to those values. I think the banks of our river are our core values. So if we have our core values, how we apply them over time will be very flexible. You know, if your core value is like um, movement, maybe when you're a kid, it's just playing. Then maybe you're a competitive athlete then maybe it's Tai Chi, then maybe it's walking. But like that core value is still there to guide you as you evolve. So diversify your identity, have these multiple rooms, and then have these core values that as you flow over time, as your identity, as your process of becoming unfolds, your core values are what's going to channel that in, in a direction that makes narrative sense. Now this core values topic we've talked a lot about on the show, but whenever it comes up, our audience members feel bit overwhelmed. We have a lot of perfectionists in the audience. And you have a list in the appendix of core values. And oftentimes, 
they all sound great. We want every single one of them to be a core value. Who doesn't want to value movement and compassion and kindness and intellectual? And all of a sudden, you overwhelm yourself with this ident- this core value plate that you can't possibly have enough rooms in the house for. So how do you actually whittle it down to understand what are those core values that really matter from a list that looks amazing and who wouldn't want all of those core values? It's hard. It's the hardest part of the acceptance and commitment process, I think, is is doing just that. Um, But if everything's important, then nothing's important. It's very cliche, but I think it's true. So I think a forcing mechanism of getting to three to five core values is actually really important. And it's not to say that others don't matter and that you don't want to be all 100, but it's to say like, these are the three to five hills I'm going to die on. Or like when there's a real big change, this is kind of my menu of options for how to respond to that big change. And a couple of ways. One is to think about people in your life that you really admire. And of the 30 that you're wrestling with, ask like, what five do you really admire them for? Because those are the five that you probably value the most. Another way to do it is to imagine yourself um, older, wiser version of you down the road looking back on current you. And what do you want older, wiser you to remember yourself for? And then a final way that appears in a lot of acceptance and commitment um, therapy manuals is this notion of like, what's going to be on your gravestone? And you can't fit all 100. So it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy to whittle down. And it's not that you don't care about all of these wonderful core values, but it's about saying like, what are, what are the ones that are really essential? And when I go through this exercise with people, most people can tend to get it to like 15 to 20. And that doesn't take much time, but the process of getting it from 15 to 20 to three to five, that can take like two months. And it's wrestling with things, it's combining things, it's kind of figuring out like, I like sport, movement, health and well-being, and these are all kind of related. So like, what's the overarching thing there? And maybe it's vitality. Maybe it's completely different than tennis. You know, you end up, you start with like sport and you end up with vitality. Um, But I think just kind of wrestling with these and asking like being versus having, what's the underlying thing here? Um, And then getting it down to three to five. And then for each of those, as we talk about is um, it's so important to like really define them because Everyone's probably worked for a company with like core values on the wall, but that's it. Like they're on a pretty poster and no one actually practices them. So these are only useful if you know what they mean and and you're able to call on them in day-to-day life. And then in that change to channel them as a way forward. So a lot of the change that is discussed isn't of your control or isn't of your agency. So yes, there might be a time where you go, you know what? LA is for me, I'm going to move to LA and I'm going to chase this dream and I'm going to get on a plane. But there might be times where your career says, hey, there's no more work for you here in New York. We need to move you to Miami. And all of a sudden, this change is forced upon you. And in that, you need to bring those core values to the forefront and say, okay, how can I act in these core values on a daily basis to find my homeostasis in this new location? to really ground myself in who I am in a completely new environment, meeting new people and potentially making new friends and getting closer with colleagues and performing at my best. If you don't have those core values or if you have a list of 50, well, that change is going to be very difficult for you to reorient yourself in that new environment. Exactly. I couldn't have said it better myself. Your core values are your sources of stability. Like That's your ruggedness. And you can take them with you pretty much wherever you go. How you practice them will look very different, but the actual values themselves, they can always guide your actions. And generally speaking, if we're acting in alignment with our values, what we're going through doesn't get easier, but we tend to feel a little bit better than if it's just total chaos. And this is the the, the point that we try to make with all of our X Factor members, which is if you get these core values correct, When you engage in them, your whole life is going to change for the better. You're going to feel that much more better because you're actually engaged in the things that are important to you. And if it's done right, they're also tied towards a goal. So by engaging in these core values every day, you're getting closer to your goal through the the, what is important to you. So you wake up excited. And so we tell all our, of our members, don't worry about nailing this today as we discuss this. 
get get your three together and then we'll work in the next few weeks to see and round out what those other two might be because these are going to have a significant impact on how how you go about today and then how you see the world through engaging in these core values and then lastly uh the the what you said about why these need to be protected is so important and there's so much in this world that errs on the side of take it easy. You need to relax. You can't, you need to just go with the flow. Well, unfortunately, when it comes to these core values, if you do, if you have that mindset towards these core values, well, then they're not guiding anything, are they? They're, they're, you're still just twisting in the wind. These are going to be your rudder to get you to where you want to go why it is so important that you learn how to b- build boundaries around them and that and, and adhere to them. That's right. You guys are both just like preaching and I'm here for it. Um, I think that, you know, the way that I like to think about it is like, it's okay to be super rigid on your core values and then be flexible on everything else. Yep. And 100%. you look at like evolution, you know, change on the grandest scale there is. And the species that survive, they do just that. Like the attributes that they don't change are the attributes that make them who they are. Because if they lost those, they would no longer be who they are. But then you, like, you better believe they change everything else. So they are like completely non dual, super rugged on the core values and then flexible everywhere else. And for listeners, it sounds like you do a lot of this good work in the X Factor. But in case people aren't a part of that or are new to this, it also doesn't have to be that complicated. You know, a value of creativity might just mean 45 minutes of deep focus work on a creative project a day. It's amazing what 45 minutes of deep focus work on a creative project will do for a creative person that doesn't have that. Presence might just mean putting your phone away between 6 and 8 p.m., even if it's so hard to do, to be there for your friends, your spouse, your kids if you have them. Um, Movement or health could just be 30-minute walk four days a week. So like the... The changes themselves are often small and simple, and the effects truly are transformational. And that's why the core value alignment is so important, because then it doesn't feel like effort. It, you don't have to muster your willpower if you truly value presence. If it's something that is a core value and is a guiding principle that you're rigid on, then you're not going to have to muster your willpower every day to turn off your phone for an hour. You're going to recognize that as a core value, that's how you want to show up for the people in your life. And turning off that phone is going to get easier and easier. And it's going to go from an hour to two hours to maybe it'll be on airplane mode for four hours. And you'll have that deep space to then be creative. You bring up a great point. When you hold all 50 core values rigid, you can't act on any of them. (laughs) A lot of these core values are in opposition. And all of a sudden, that's why you're feeling stuck. That's why you're feeling unmotivated or that life may be meaningless because you haven't really wrestled with the tougher question of like, who am I at an identity level? What rooms do I want to decorate? Do I want to lean into in my house? And what things really aren't that important that I don't need to get flustered about because the media is telling me to or social media is or my friends are pressuring me to. When you actually understand your core values at a deep level, it allows you to move forward in a much faster way than those around you who are overwhelmed with all the different pressures that life throws at you. And it makes you so much more rugged throughout change because change is still hard, but it's a little bit less scary because you got your body armor on and your or your identity armor, let's call it. And those are just your core values. And then the natural question that some listeners might be thinking is, well, can your core values change? And the answer is, of course. But even so, it's your current core values and you're practicing your current core values that take you to your new ones. So they really do guide your evolution. That is, I think that's the purpose of core values. Again, like, you know, identity is a river. Like you're constantly flowing, you're changing, it's fluid. These core values are what's guiding it. And if they guide you to a new tributary and the core values change, that's great. Now, part of this that you mentioned earlier is this idea that when expectations don't meet reality, there is suffering. And unfortunately, our brain is constantly creating expectations. It's a predictive model of the world around us. And it's taking in past information and experiences. And then it's shooting out this prediction. And if that prediction lingers or we're continuing to hold on to it, well, we're going to create immense suffering. So how can we quickly evolve and update these expectations to manage the change when it's not meeting our expectations? So for example, some members of our audience will hear the show and be like, you know what, I'm moving to a new city. 
And then they'll write us six months later and they're like, man, making friends in a new city is so much more challenging than I thought. I thought just changing my environment would naturally open up this new tribe of people and my dating life would be better because it wasn't good in my old environment. Again, their expectations created this reality that now they're wrestling with and they haven't been able to update and evolve that model and their prediction and it's creating suffering. That's right. So I think um, the first thing is to try to lessen expectations. And this isn't to say commit to mediocrity or have low expectations. I don't think that's a good recipe for a meaningful life. But it's to lessen the importance that you place on expectations. So to be more willing to adjust and adapt them and to ask yourself, like, did I have an expectation that maybe was right a week ago, but now something changed and it's different? And if the answer is yes, I mean, this is this is about just like letting go of that old expectation as gracefully as possible, um, knowing that even though it can hurt to let go of these expectations, it's actually the pathway to to being able to take productive action and to deal with the situation that is um, that's in front of you. But it's th- this is this is a very challenging thing to do because our brains spend a lot of time thinking about the future and building up expectations. And like you said, they are a prediction machine. And when those predictions aren't true, it can be disorienting. It's like order, disorder, reorder. I think a part of disorder is expectations not being met. Um, but I think this is one of those mental ninja moves that you can pull is just knowing this, like naming it can help so much getting to a situation and being like, ooh, the reason this is so hard is I didn't expect this was going to be the case, but here it is. So I need to stop living as if my expectation were true and start meeting my reality exactly how it is, how it is in front of me. What can you control that's not meeting this expectation, right? So a lot of times- Separating what you can't control from what you can and then then working on what you can, exactly. Exactly. You know, through through the journaling exercise of, okay, well, my expectation was I was going to land in L.A., and I was going to go to a meetup group, and naturally I'd have two best friends, and I'd have a social group, and I'd be dating new people within a month. Okay, well, I went to the meetup group. I didn't meet anyone. I didn't meet the expectation. Well, then what's under my control? Going to the next meetup group. What's under my control? Texting the person that I met at the meetup group instead of waiting for them to ask me out to lunch or invite me to something, me taking control and moving things forward. So oftentimes when our expectations don't meet reality, It's your job then to sort through, well, what can I control to move me closer to that expectation if that expectation is really important to me? Yeah, I I like how you said that a lot. This gets back again to like rugged flexibility. So it's not giving up in nihilism and despair because that's not useful, but it's also not, you know, judging yourself and being like, well, I should have been able to completely contrive this move to LA and everything should have gone perfect because that's how I envisioned it. Um, it's a middle ground. Like, hey, this isn't this isn't feeling how I hoped it would. And that's really hard. And there's nothing I can do to fix this overnight. But here are some steps in my control that I can take. Having the expectation that they might not work the first, second, third time. It might take four or five times. I think this is especially true with um, friendship and intimate partnerships. We don't realize how often putting yourself out there and meeting people They're just not going to be the right fit for the people that you want to hang out with, whether, again, whether this is an intimate context or a friendship context. And that's just like a cost of finding someone that is like someone that you want to hang out with. So oftentimes, like making making friendships, forget intimacy, making friendships requires like a lot of work and false starts and inconvenience. And then you find a group or a person that's like, oh, like these are my people and then it's all worth it. I want to also go over the rationalizations that, that come with that as well, that we have to identify when, when we're doing that. So for the guy who maybe is, who wants to be dating, but he's not going out to create any options, and then against everything that he's been told his whole life, the girl in the office starts to look very attractive, and then he starts to think, oh, maybe I should be asking out. Uh, the girl in the office, and then we get an email going, hey, there's this girl at work that I really like. How do I go about doing that? (laughs) We have to go through this whole thing again of why are you doing that? Are you creating other options in your life? If not, you need to be so that doesn't happen because of the way we are wired in our biology. uh, If you don't create options, options will be created for you. Now, this also goes to play of moving someone into a new place 
And as AJ mentioned, well, I'm going to go to the meetup group and I hope I meet somebody cool and then I'll have a new best friend and I won't be so lonely here. And as you mentioned, not everyone you meet is going to be worth your time. And again, you have to be creating options and then have the ability to showcase your value in, a, in any social setting where people take interest and curiosity uh, who you are. And once those expectations are being set up and you begin to realize what it takes to meet, to, to meet your own expectations, let alone other people's, therein lies gaps that you are able to fill to show people without telling them of your value, which allows them to take that much more interest and curiosity and in get and wanting to get to know you and friend and befriend you. Something that came up a lot in my reporting is that friendship is a big part of like the change that disorients us. So we grow apart from friends. We have fallouts with friends. We simply just like move geographies and grow apart. Sometimes it's really hot and messy. Sometimes it's cold. We make new friends. Um, we make new really close friends. And then it's like, ooh, is my best friend no longer Jim from undergraduate school? Um, and we often define ourselves, especially if we're a more extroverted person, by our friends. So when our friends shift, how we conceive of ourselves shifts. So I'm glad that we're spending some time here because I think this notion of like, social circles and friendship, and of course, intimate partnership too, but but friendship especially, because I think people tend to have more comings and goings with intimate friends than intimate partners. And uh, it's a big source of change in our life. Well, I think a lot of Western culture celebrates this idea of best friends for life. I mean, the hit show Friends. This idea that, you know, you should never lose friends. And if you meet someone in college and, and they're your roommate, and because of proximity, you share a time and space in your life together, then they should carry on through your 80s as a friend in your life. And then unfortunately, that view, you know, leads people to feel very lonely and isolated when those friendships don't work out. And oftentimes they'll find us and say, hey, I need some help in my social life. I need some help even finding romantic partners because I didn't realize that the person that I was a friend with was going to change. And I didn't realize that I was going to change. I had sort of hoped we'd both march through life in lockstep together, sharing the same views, sharing the same values, even though we never really had that conversation when we were having a couple beers in our dorm room together. So it can be very jarring and disorienting. And we've talked a lot about external change and change that's happening to us, but the relationship component, I think, especially when you look at the failure rate of marriage in the U.S., change is just not expected. We're not ready for it. And when it happens to us, it often leads to the demise of the relationship. And there's not enough flexibility on how we view other people's change around us. And there tends to be this rigidness of like, well, I have to cut him out of my life. I have to break that friendship. I have to break up with my friend or I have to go through divorce. When in actuality, I think if we had a healthier flexibility around people changing around us while we're changing, we could actually strengthen our relationships. And the Harvard Happiness Study shows that the quality of your relationships ultimately is the quality of your life. More so than exercise, lifting weights, what you eat, it really is those relationships in our lives. So in your research around change, what piece around relationships are you now viewing things differently uh, as you go through change in, in your life? Ooh, this is so good. So I think that... Um Let's separate them into intimate relationships, romantic relationships, and then friendships. Yeah. So for intimate relationships, I think the most important thing is to think of the relationship as a holding space for the partnership, for you as individuals, if you have kids, for the family unit to evolve and grow. And that is so different than how, you know, my parents and like the baby boomers, like control, like, you know, make mom happy. Like the job of the relationship is to be, I think, and this is, I'm not a relationship therapist. This is just my, my theory out of researching this book is it's to be like an easy chair that like feels really comfortable to sit in, but to allow for a whole lot of flexibility and change in how you relate to your partner, how you relate to your children, how they relate to you, how, how, um, how the intimacy plays out, but then also to have those kind of rugged core values that like make the relationship what it is. So to have a few things like, you know, I really love this person for these three things. And therefore, I'm going to be totally fine if they change in 19 other ways. I want them to change in 19 other ways. I think it's also really important not to feel like you need to change the exact same ways as your partner. 
because then you get into all kinds of enmeshment and like, you know, resentment and, and all this stuff. Like, it's okay if your partner gets totally into Buddhism and goes to the Buddhist Sangha without you. You know, not the end of the world, as long as you have these underlying core values that bind you together. A lot of listeners will take our core values exercise earlier and say, okay, great. Now I just need to find a partner that has those exact same core values. <laughs> and that's actually not what we're looking for. Right. But what, what is important is to recognize and respect your partner's core values. So a lot of the disagreements and the surface level arguments, if you actually take the lens of someone's core values and understand what the deeper motivations are for people, these idiosyncrasies, these, ide these small things like leaving a dish in the sink or uh, not taking the garbage out, could actually be alleviated from arguments if you understood that, well, creativity is his core value and he's been strumming guitar working on this new lick for the last two hours. That's why the garbage didn't go out. Okay, now I understand it. I have more patience and I have more flexibility towards my partner's core values where they're rigid and vice versa. And that's such a powerful exercise for couples. And we talk about it with all of our clients. If you have a partner, understand your own and then ask what theirs are and do the exercise together. And you'll understand each other in a deeper way. So you can be flexible in the moments that require flexibility. And you can express, hey, this is an area that I'm rigid in because this is really a core value. This is really meaningful to me. And that's why that dish stayed in the sink and I didn't get to it. Versus creating the surface level arguments and disagreements that can tear us apart when we don't recognize our partner's core values. That's right. So I almost included a chapter in the book on rugged flexibility for relationships. Um, I didn't because a lot of the tenants in relationships felt universal enough to the rest of the book. But um, I did create some bonus material for people that pre-order the book. And regardless if you pre-order or order it at all, like I'll, I'll send that to you to put in the show notes for your listeners so y'all can just have it. I hope people read the book because I think this is like a really important topic which is just that, like we got to take rugged flexibility and apply it to our relationships. Um, the other thing that you're getting to, and I see this often with people that are chasing like perfection, is that good enough over and over and over again is how you get to perfect. So like expecting a partner to be perfect or like have this, you know, we look at the sunrise and we think the same thoughts um, and we listen to the same music. Like that is a very immature way to think about relationships because everybody poops and whether they're going to poop day one or year one, like eventually, like, you know, it's not going to be all peaches and cream. And I think people want a perfect relationship. So they switch from perfect to perfect to perfect. And the internet and online dating gives you infinite possibilities to create the false expectation that perfect is out there. When I've seen the happiest, best relationships are people that are just good enough together, but after 30 years of being good enough, the end result is perfect. Um, and I think, man, Western culture holds up perfection and it's just bullshit. Like it is a false expectation. It's chasing the Energizer bunny that's always 10 yards ahead. And the worst part about it is how do you handle yourself when things aren't perfect? If you're chasing perfect, you're not prepared for it. What tells me more about how you're going to be as a partner for me romantically is what happens when things don't go our way, when we don't meet those expectations. Are you chastising the waiter? Are you screaming at the Uber driver because we're late to the airport? Are you yelling at the ticket agent because they closed the doors to the plane and we didn't get on the trip? Or are you understanding that, hey, you know, there's a lot of things that were out of our control here. And in that imperfect moment, you can actually get closer with one another. And I think so much of the chasing perfect partner, you know, I had a, a client ask, well, I have a list of questions. These are 15 questions that I, I need to know their answers on because we, if we align, then we'll most likely get married. Whew, and I'm like, that's a pretty high expectation, <laughs> man. You, you do realize that the answers you had to those questions 10 years ago are different than they are now. And oftentimes we don't realize how far we've come. And we think when we look towards the future, that change really isn't going to happen. We kind of feel like we're in this, especially in adulthood, like I'm in this finalized fixed state. Like I've done all this work on myself, all the self-development. I've been in coaching programs. I'm pretty clear on who I am now. And then you look backwards, you're like, well, man, I've changed quite a bit, but you can't really see the forward change that's on the horizon. So you make these false equivalencies like, well, these are the answers I'm searching for. And then when we do the exercise, like, well, actually, no, I have evolved on about seven of these just in the last couple of years after the pandemic. Well, don't you think your partner is probably going to evolve what their viewpoint is and what their answers might be through a relationship with you? 
Yeah, you're not marrying a person or partnering with a person in time. You're partnering with someone to like be there as you walk your path, not even necessarily walk it exactly with you, but be there as you walk your path, and then you're going to be there as, as they walk theirs. And that's a much healthier expectation than I'm marrying this person. You know, it, it's in the relationship guide, and like if I was going to end up doing the full chapter, this is what I would have focused on, but it's the having versus being. Are you, are you in a having relationship or a being relationship? And if you're in a having relationship, it's going to be really fragile because all that stuff's going to change. Well, what happens in, oftentimes in these situations now is, okay, so you find that romantic partner and you're willing then to give up on your social life. You're willing to give up and sacrifice your social relationships. And that change can be very jarring for people on the other end who maybe are single or maybe are in a happy relationship, but they still want to maintain that friendship. So oftentimes change romantically will then lead to change socially that creates a loss in those expectations and a straining, if not completely breaking of those relationships. So if we look at change from a social relationship realm, what does the science tell us? So there the science tells us um, exactly what you were alluding to earlier. Those articles that were going around about like um, breaking up with friends, just stupid. Like you don't, you don't break up with friends. Like there shouldn't be a hostility towards friends. Friends can come and go throughout your life and the same person can come and go throughout your life. And you should cherish the moments when they're there to support you. And if you grow in different directions or you change or you get in an intimate relationship that demands more of your time or God forbid you have two kids, like those friendships are all going to change. And if there's any kind of expectation that things were going to be the same as they were when, you know, whenever, whatever the golden days were, like, got to get that expectation out of your head. Don't put that much pressure on a friendship. You know, sometimes the best of friends are like people that were there for you 20 years ago, and then maybe you kind of lose touch with, and then 10 years, they're, they're back in your life. And there's no, hey, what happened? There's no resentment. It's like, what happened was I moved across the country and you got a job in the minor league baseball playing a 182 game travel season. Like, that's it. And I think we do a lot of overanalyzing. You know, what does this mean? And oftentimes it just means like life is complicated and um, things are always changing, including, including our friendships. Now, does this give you permission to be a flake and like to flake out on people? No. There's a big difference between like flaking out day to day and having some big shifts in your life that then lead you to new friends. You see this often um, with marriage, as you mentioned, with children with recovery from major illness or diagnosis with major illness, so cancer survivors, people that have experienced really bad depression. Um, you see this with people that retire and all their friends were through a work context. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is like, this is normal. The problem is a culture that says something is wrong. Like, of course, your friendships are going to change when you got diagnosed with stage three cancer and none of your friends have had that experience. Like, you can't expect them to have had that experience. And with that, there's this cognitive distortion of personalizing everything. So it's very easy to feel like, oh, well, they're doing this behavior specifically for a reason to impact me, negative or positive. When in actuality, they may be going through massive change and they haven't had a chance to communicate that change with you and has absolutely nothing to do with you. And what would actually heal a relationship is you coming forward and being like, hey, I realize we've drifted apart. I still really care about you. And I'm rooting for you. And I, I hope that fatherhood is going really great. I'm excited to meet your son. Or, hey, I, I realize you move cross country and work is completely new for you in this new job. And we haven't kept up, but I'm still here for you, man. I'm still cheering you on. And you'd be surprised how those little actions, those little behaviors strengthen relationship far more than just making blanket assumptions like this person doesn't care about me. Now they moved across the country. I have to break up with them or I have to never talk to them again because of their actions in this relationship. Yeah, that's right. And the only last thing that I'll add here, and you you all spend a lot more time thinking about relationships in particular than me, so you might have um, a more nuanced take. But I think that it's one of these catch-22s with technology that it allows us to stay close to people that are geographically very far from us. But it can also have this negative impact if we don't develop bonds where we are. And I think it's easy to have a couple really good friends that are geographically far away, but it's hard to have all your good friends be people that are geographically far away. And this could just be my experience, but my experience is like proximity is actually really important for me in friendships. Um, I can have, you know, a best friend I do in California. He's like a brother. 
right now in my life. And, and that's not a problem. But like the almost brothers, but not really friendships, those aren't the same when I'm not in proximity. And, and I have many good friends now in Asheville where there is proximity. And that's kind of back to like acceptance. You know, humans were meant to be in proximity. Um, and again, I'm sure that there's all kinds of um, different temperaments and different people are somewhere on a spectrum. But I think that if you're struggling, one one question to ask yourself maybe is like the proximity one. Well, with that, again, going back to our, our mind, so we'll glance at social media, we'll see a photo, and then our predictive model fires and goes, oh, fatherhood must be great for my buddy who moved to New York City. Like, I don't need to reach out to him. He just posted a photo of his son. When in actuality, that's a reason to reach out. And we encourage all of our coaching clients, what people are posting about on social, that might be really amazing, or it might be a way for them to have the social media mask when in actuality, they're struggling, but they want to keep that digital presence going. So each one of those moments, instead of relying on your predictive model and your brain saying, oh, they're busy, or oh, they're having a great time on vacation, use that as a moment to reach out and celebrate them, check in on them. Hey, I saw you came back from Italy. That sounded amazing. What's going on? What'd you enjoy? You would be amazed at how much those reach outs, whether in person or digitally, matter to strengthening these relationships instead of relying on the social media and technology that seems to be feeding these stories about who people are in our lives. Yeah, I could not agree more. Uh, I think that's spot on. Is like, don't trust the algorithm. And like you said, generally, I, I think not even sometimes, <laughs> I think generally it's telling you the opposite. So the more someone feels the need to post happy family pictures, the more my radar goes up of like something's probably not so happy right now. Not always, but I think often. So for those who are in the midst of change, what can we do to handle it? What are the four Ps that you recommend? The four Ps are to pause and take a deep breath. Maybe take a week. If it's a really big change, if it's a health diagnosis, maybe take a month. And not immediately rush into fixing mode, but really pause and assess the situation. Accept it, update your expectations. Then process. So once you're seeing reality clearly, ask yourself, what does this mean? Then make a plan, because we do generally have some agency. So given what's happening, given what it means, what are the various roads we can take to move forward? And which of those roads do I want to choose first, knowing that I can always adjust? And then we proceed. But we only proceed after we go through that process, which is very different than a reactionary mode, which are two Ps, which tends to be panic and pummel ahead. <laughs> <laughs> can I, with panic and pummel ahead, I just want to add there too. Sometimes retreating to a safe place so that you can observe, right, is the right thing to do. It may not be going forward, but it allows you an objective mind, to get an objective mind, to see the field and to see what's going on, to make better decisions. <laughs> Panic and pummel forward is not going to be it. I love you that. You like my two, I, my two Ps yeah. versus four well, Ps. I mean, because I mean, it's I, true. I've, That's what I've, happens, right? I've been, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been there for most of my life. I mean, I think all men, so, and AJ and I grew up in a very blue-collar family, so it's just like... You keep stepping forward no matter what punches are, well, are coming your way. It is way. counter it's, biology it's like <laughs> because change does create a stress response. And that stress response fuels panic. I mean, your body is telling you to panic. So it really takes a higher level of thinking for you to go, hey, wait a second. Let me pause here, not react in a moment where my body is wiring me to react. Yeah, and, and that takes a lot of practice. Um, something that can help with pausing is just naming your emotions. So when you name an emotion, you create some space between yourself and your experience of it. And that space is the definition of a pause. Uh, mindfulness practice. I mean, if there is a point to meditation, it's this. It's to be able to create some space between immediate feelings, thoughts, urges, and what you do about them. And I think this is something that takes practice. Uh, if you're in the groove of just immediately reacting it's going to be really hard to take a deep breath. And we can practice this in small situations in our life, like that email that we want to send. Wait 10 seconds. Give it another read. That 
text when we're in a really hot emotional state, like wait to fire it off. Yeah. Don't send it. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. Maybe the answer is never send it, but but (laughs) we can practice, we can practice when the stakes are lower so that that muscle is fairly developed when, when the stakes are high. I love that. Thank you for sharing, Brad. You have five questions in the book. We'll save that for those who purchased the book. But a last question for you that we ask every one of our guests is what is your X factor? What do you think makes you unique and extraordinary? I think what makes me unique and extraordinary, oh man, I don't like to toot my own horn here. I was going to say like the people around me. Um, I'm really blessed with good people around me. Uh, my partner, my best friend, my kids, um, my editor on the book project. But um, what I pride myself most on in my writing is I try to marry head and heart. And I try to take a very intellectual view, but also a very like heartful view. And we don't have a word for this in English, but in um, in Pali, which is the, a Sanskrit, the word is sita. And sita is like the mind heart. And I love that word because when I sit down to write, I try to bring that to bear. So it's not the mind or the heart, but it's the mind heart. Um, so I aspire to that. Now, am I perfect? Far from it, but that's the X factor of it I aspire to. Well, I could definitely sense it in your writing. Both books we enjoyed immensely. Where can our audience find more about the book, the bonus, and everything else that you do, Brad? Thanks. So the book is Master of Change, and it is available wherever you get books. You can get it in any format, so hardcover, Kindle, or audio. Um, Like I said, I'm just going to give your audience that bonus because I know you all spend a lot of time helping people with relationships. Uh, If people read through that and they like it, then they should pick up the book. And um, you can find more about me at my website, which is just my name, www.bradstalberg.com. Thank you, Brad. It was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure, AJ and John. Thank you. 